This is Space Time, Series 26, Episode 37. Coming up on Space Time, a dangerous asteroid on its way to Earth. A new study finds meteor impacts on the Moon are mirrored on Earth. And Rocket Lab launches its second electron from the United States. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Well, despite some predictions of doom and gloom, NASA says an asteroid on an orbit that will take it awfully close to the Earth will almost certainly miss the planet. The 50-metre-wide space rock, catalogued as 2023 DW, was originally thought to have a 1 in 625 chance of hitting the Earth on Valentine's Day 2046. The threat of a direct impact was initially raised by NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office based on the limited orbital data they had at the time of its discovery. Now, as more and more observations are gathered, NASA has revised its estimates, placing the asteroid's chances of hitting the Earth at more like 1 in 770. That equates to a 99.87% chance of missing the planet. And as more orbital data observations come in, those numbers are expected to get even better. And it's not just NASA. The European Space Agency's own Near-Earth Object Coordination Office has also lowered its risk assessment, downgrading its odds of a direct impact from 1 in 625 to 1 in 1,584. Still, even if 2023 DW does end up slamming into the Earth, and that's highly unlikely, it wouldn't be catastrophic, at least not as bad as, say, the 10-kilometer white Chicxulub asteroid, which crashed into Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula 66 million years ago, triggering the KT boundary event mass extinction, which wiped out some 75% of all life on Earth, including all the non-avian dinosaurs. At 50 metres, roughly the size of an Olympic swimming pool, 2023 DW will be noticed, with an impact likely to be similar to a large thermonuclear explosion, but without all the radiation. Now, a lot of people are comparing a potential impact of 2023 DW with that of the 2013 airburst explosion of the 20-metre-wide asteroid which burst in the skies above the Russian town of Chelyabinsk. That generated a blast roughly equal to 500 kilotons of TNT. And to put that in perspective, that's some 33 times the amount of energy released by the Hiroshima atomic bomb. The Chelyabinsk Blinkst explosion injured over 1,500 people, not directly from the blast itself, but from debris and shards of glass in damaged buildings, which were hit by shock waves from the explosion. But I think a far better analogy might be the 1908 Tunguska event. On the morning of June 30th, 1908, a massive explosion with the force of a 5 megaton thermonuclear device, the equivalent of a thousand Hiroshima bombs, smashed into northern Siberia. The blast was so powerful, it lit up the night sky in London a third of the way around the planet. The orange glow allowed Brits to read their evening newspapers without turning on the lights. Seismographs a thousand kilometres away also recorded the event, and that sparked intense scientific interest. Researchers were able to triangulate the blast location to the remote Tunguska River region of northern Siberia, but it took 19 years for a scientific expedition to reach the isolated location. What greeted them upon their arrival was a scene of utter devastation. The entire landscape had been flattened. The explosion raised some 80 million trees over an area of more than 2,000 square kilometres. Mature trees had been snapped off at their bases and covered the ground for hundreds of kilometres like matchsticks and all of them were pointing away from the blast's epicentre, thought to be at the location of what is now Lake Chico. Locals who witnessed the blast described a column of blue light that moved across the sky in the cool summer's morning air, followed by a tremendous explosion. The explosion and eyewitness accounts are all consistent with an asteroid impact, but mysteriously, no crater has ever been found. And that's led scientists to speculate that the asteroid probably airburst before reaching the planet's surface. The idea of an airburst was also consistent with one unusual characteristic of the impact site. 
All the flattened trees pointed away from the blast zone, except those at the very epicentre. They remained upright. Computer simulations support the idea of an explosion caused by an airburst of a meteor somewhere between 1 and 200 metres across. So there's always the possibility that Valentine's Day in 2046 might rock your world after all. This is space time. Still to come, a new study shows that asteroid impacts on the moon are mirrored on Earth and Rocket Lab launches its second electron from the United States. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Scientists have discovered that asteroid impacts on the moon millions of years ago coincided precisely with some of the largest meteorite impacts on Earth, including the KT boundary event impactor, which wiped out all the non-avian dinosaurs 66 million years ago. The findings reported in the journal Science Advances also shows that major impact events on Earth are not standalone events, but are accompanied by a series of smaller impacts. Now, all this sheds new light on asteroid dynamics within the inner solar system, including the likelihood of potentially devastating Earth-bound asteroids. The study's authors examined microscopic glass beads up to 2 billion years old that were found in lunar soil brought back to Earth in December 2020 as part of the Chinese National Space Agency's Chang'e 5 lunar mission. The heat and pressure of meteorite impacts created the glass beads, and so their age and distribution should mimic the impacts, revealing a timeline of bombardment. The study's lead author, Professor Alexander Nemchin from Curtin University, says the findings imply that the timing and frequency of asteroid impacts on the Moon may well have been mirrored here on Earth, telling scientists more about the history of evolution on this planet. The authors combined a wide range of microscopic analytical techniques, numerical modelling and geological surveys to determine how these microscopic glass beads from the Moon were formed and when. They found that some of the age groups for the lunar glass beads just happened to coincide precisely with the ages of some of the largest terrestrial impact craters on Earth. And that included the Chicxulub impact crater, responsible for the Cretaceous tertiary boundary mass extinction event, which, as we said earlier in the show, wiped out 75% of all life on this planet. The study also found that large impact events on Earth, such as Chicxulub, could also be accompanied by lots of smaller impacts as well. Now, if this is correct, it suggests that the age and frequency distribution of impacts on the Moon might provide valuable information about impacts on the Earth and in a solar system. And further comparative studies could well give greater insight into the geological history of the Moon. Nemchin says the next step is to compare the data gleaned from these Chang'e 5 samples with other lunar soles and crater ages in order to be able to uncover other significant Moon-wide impact events which might in turn reveal new evidence about what impacts may have affected life on Earth. We know that the solar they are quite common in all lunar soils, so we specifically search for them. And we also know that we can determine their ages and that some of them at least are related to impact. And they formed by impact when something hit, a projectile hit the ground, doesn't really matter where on the moon, on Earth or other planets. There is enough energy to melt some of this material distributed as a little droplet, it melts, solidifies, and then we finish with, with glass. So by analyzing the materials, this glass bit, we, we can actually get the age of twin parts, and that was kind of what is the general aim of the studies people do with the thing. So we did it with the new sample, because the new sample is different slightly, and then there are some interesting results coming out of that we see that there is a periodicity uh, in impact on the moon. And uh, we also see that this periodicity seems to be correlated with other impacts that we know about, on not uh, not necessarily on the moon, but in, in other places in solar systems. So that's a kind of very quick description of, uh, of what we've got from the beginning to the end. So you were able to date these little glass beads. What was that, uranium to lead dating was used? Yeah, in our case, uh, we, we used uranium to lead, but uh, some other people used uh, potassium to argon, mm. uh, decay 
and also uh, determine ages successfully. So, so there are different methods confirming the same thing, which is good. Uh, in, in a way, yes. Well, we, we we're not necessarily at that stage for some re- reason. Uh, we somehow never tried using both methods in, in the same sample. But uh, yeah, that is one of the things. That we, uh, we're a little bit slow, but we were getting there. At some point, we definitely will try to apply both techniques to uh, the same step of them. Samples. And when you looked at the ages, in some instances, they coincided with known dates for impacts on Earth, including Chicxulub. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's right. So we, we're familiar with the certain things. There is another uh, interesting group of uh, ages. That there are some mit- fragments of meteorites found in Sweden and in specific layers from, uh, in sedimentary rocks. And, and we also kind of know the age of, of this group. And then, so we're recording similar ages in our population of glasses from the moon. So there is this consistency across two different planets somehow. Just the other day, there was a study we reported on which looked at a large impact crater in the North Atlantic Ocean just off the coast of Africa, which also appears to coincide with the Chicxulub impact. So it appears, at least in the case of Chicxulub, this is the, the dinosaur-killing yeah. asteroid, it yeah. wasn't a single event. It was a, There may have been a cluster of rocks which impacted. Some of them hit the yeah. Earth, some hit the Moon. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, we, we also see this, this group of uh, ages in, in meteorites that are coming from asteroid belts. So the idea is that it also happens, something's happening in asteroid belt at the same time. So it's it all, this event uh, probably happening at an increased, increased rate all through the inner solar system somehow. Where to next? Oh. Uh, Yes, okay, well, this is our kind of first confirmation. It's not like we, we found this uh, thing for the first time. People have been suspecting that something like that is going to be probably happening in, in, in the inner solar system. We got the confirmation and we're now more confident that there is this periodicity on the right. Probably it's not, we're not talking about individual impacts, but groups of impacts or rocks flying at certain periods of time. So we need to push it a little bit further and then try to understand why. Well, we understand that something happening probably in the solar system that destabilizes orbits uh, of, say, asteroids. Normally, they, they kind of fly in predictable way, but something periodically happens and that destabilizes the orbit and they start smashing into planets, each other, and so on. But we, we don't really know the reason, so we need to understand the reason. For that, we need to look further and then probably confirm it in our yet other samples and see if there is this actual period. Is that regular period? Are we seeing this increases every, say, 10 million years or 20 or 30? Or is it all random? There are several of them during the history, but there is no regular space kind of between you know, time, regular time, let's put it that way, between them. Uh, and that would probably help us to, to determine what is the reason. There are some interesting theories for that, aren't there? There's the solar system moving up and down through the galactic disk idea. Yeah, There's yeah. The, uh, the idea of a as yet unknown large body in the outer solar system that we haven't found mm. yet that's kicking comets and asteroids towards the inner solar system. So yeah. some, some pretty interesting ideas out there. Yeah, yeah, of course. But uh, there's multiple things. And then, of course, for example, knowing if there is a time difference between the increases, say you, you mentioned this up and down movement of, of uh, solar system and galaxy, this is happening sort of the big period of about 30 million years. If we can link peaks in asteroids and then see that they are 30 million years, then we've got kind of further confirmation that maybe this, maybe this changes. Another possibility is that the process is quite random. Say a couple of asteroids, for some reason, collide in asteroid belt, and then it's like a hot, two cars colliding on a highway during traffic, uh, heavy traffic. It usually results in pile-up or, or something like that. Only in asteroid belt, they start flying in all sorts of directions. So it could be then random, but again, we don't know enough detail about the process to start saying what suggestion, idea, uh, is correct. Or maybe there is something something else we don't even know about yet. That's what makes it exciting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So we, we certainly got plenty of, of, of things to worry about and think about. A lot of people ask, does it mean anything in terms of our uh, own survival and does it pose a threat to, to us? Uh, and uh, well, again, we're talking about periodicity probably counting in millions of years. So in that respect, if we've got the regular process responsible for that, then we probably can sleep Separately and not to worry too much about crazy asteroids coming out of way tomorrow and then 
killing all of us. Something probably going to happen, but uh, not not in, in the lifetime of many, many generations. We'll need a few more DART missions to hone our skills in that regard. Yeah, yeah. I think we, we should be able to prepare ourselves, but we've still got plenty of time to, to do that. That's Professor Alexander Nemchin from Curtin University. And this is Space Time. Still to come, Rocket Lab launches its second electron mission from the United States, and later in the science report... 30 years of NASA satellite observations are showing not just that the planet's sea levels are increasing, but that rate of increase is accelerating. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Rocket Lab has successfully launched its second Electron mission from its new Launch Complex 2 at NASA's Wallops Island Flight Facility on the Virginian Mid-Atlantic Coast. The Stronger Together mission, which was the 34th Electron rocket launch, carried two satellites into orbit for Capella Space. The twin 100kg satellites are designed to enhance Capella's radar capabilities by capturing high-quality images of the Earth for customers. Meanwhile, while one electron was being launched from the United States East Coast, Rocket Lab was preparing a second electron on a launch pad in New Zealand, ready for its mission just days later. The Beat Goes On mission for Black Sky was launched from Pad B at Launch Complex 1 on the Mahia Peninsula on New Zealand's North Island East Coast. The rocket carried two second-generation Geospatial Intelligence and Global Monitoring Service satellites into a 450-kilometre high orbit, bringing Black Sky's constellation to 16 spacecraft. Rocket Lab has flown 32 Electron missions from its two New Zealand launch pads and began flying from Wallop Island in January. The company says with all three of its launch pads now fully operational, Rocket Lab can support up to 130 flights per year. And that'll only increase in time as development continues on the company's new neutron rocket. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. NASA has provided 30 years of satellite observation data showing the rate of sea level rise is increasing. A NASA analysis of satellite data showed that the average global sea level rise rose by 0.27 centimetres between 2021 and 2022. That's the equivalent of adding water from a million Olympic-sized swimming pools to the ocean every day of the year. In 1993, the annual rate of sea level rise was 0.20 centimetres per year. Since satellites began observing sea surface height in 1993, thanks to the US-French Topex Poseidon mission, the average global sea level has increased by 9.1 centimetres. Based on the long-term satellite measurements, the projected rate of sea level rise will reach 0.66 centimetres per year by 2050. Swabs taken by Chinese researchers from various surfaces at the Wuhan seafood and live animal markets have apparently turned up positive for coronavirus and also show that raccoon dogs were among the many animals present at the markets at the time. It was not previously known that raccoon dogs were there. They're one of the animals listed as being susceptible to COVID. French researcher Maria van Kerkhove told a World Health Organization conference there were several hypotheses about how SARS-CoV-2 could have mutated from bats to humans. The original virus, which mutated into the COVID-19 coronavirus, is thought to have come from a species of rhinolophus bat which exists in caves in Laos, some 1,700 kilometers from Wuhan, and well beyond the tiny bat's range. 
The leading hypothesis now, according to the FBI, America's Director of National Intelligence and the United States Department of Energy, is gain-of-function research engineering undertaken at the Wuhan Institute of Virology and funded by the United States National Institute of Health, of which White House Medical Advisor Dr. Anthony Fauci is the director. The key is the receptor-binding spike sequence which allows human infection. It's not yet been found in nature, despite many extensive searches. However, the idea of a natural mutation in nature through an intermediate host can't be ruled out, although no such host has yet been identified. This group are hoping the raccoon dog might be that host. COVID-19 has spread from humans to a range of animals, including domestic pets, white-tailed deer, chimpanzees, lions and tigers at the zoo, and we've even found that some 17% of all New York City rats now carry antibodies for COVID-19. The problem is, within a few days of the wet market swabs being taken, the sequences were removed by the same Chinese researchers who took the swabs. Although, likely, some other scientists did manage to download those sequences beforehand and are now investigating further. Now, this latest development does not mean that raccoon dogs or any other animals at the wet markets were infected with the virus in December 2019. Nor does it provide the missing mutation. And thanks to the Chinese Communist Party, any evidence of a possible link has now been lost. Over 6.8 million people have now been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus since it was first detected near China's Wuhan Institute of Virology around September 2019. The World Health Organization estimates the true death toll is likely to be around 16 million, with some 683 million confirmed cases globally. It's a question which has occupied many a thought over the generations. But now, a new study by researchers at Stanford University claims the average fully erect, shall we say, gentleman's most prized attribute, has actually increased in size by 24% over the past 30 years. The findings, reported in the World Journal of Men's Health, are based on a study of 55,000 American males between 1992 and 2021. They show an average increase from 4.8 to 6 inches. But the researchers warned that this increase may not necessarily be good news, as it could be caused by unhealthy habits, such as binging on junk foods. Pollution could also be a cause, because chemical exposure from pesticides or hygiene products are thought to affect the human endocrine system. On the bright side, an earlier 2018 University of Colorado study found that well-endowed gentlemen were less likely to have fertility issues, proving that size really does matter. And for the rest, there's always buying a bigger car. The Therapeutic Goods Administration has issued some 20 infringement notices, totaling some $159,840, to Mode Medical, which has been trading as drop over Australia, and one of the company's executive offices. The infringement notices are for the alleged unlawful advertising of intravenous infusion products to consumers on a company website and social media. The TGA found that the miraculous products contain prohibited representations such as claims regarding cancer and references to ingredients that are for prescription only. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says while these actions are good news, there's still a lot of other companies out there that also need to be investigated. Mode Medical goes under the name of Drip IV and basically what it is as much as anything is a mobile service to come around and give you infusions, stick a needle in your arm for whatever particular reason. So the intravenous infusion is being done to supposedly treat particular conditions. Okay. The TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, their brief is to look at advertising, promotion of products. They don't necessarily look at efficacy or safety, although they should as well, but uh, in many cases they only look at what they see as the worst case. They look at those that are the most dangerous or the most egregious promotion. And there's a lot of other products out there that should be being investigated that just aren't. And that's, well, that's, that's a funding true. thing too, the TGA. TGA don't have much money. Yeah, and the TGA is funded by the industry. It's not funded by government. Yeah. And that's also an issue, right? But then again, the FDA in America and a lot of other groups are actually funded from private sector, you know, the ones who are actually investigate it. Anyway, so this, this particular company was supposedly selling miraculous 
products, miraculous in quote, and was being used to, in reference to cancer and other conditions, and was claiming it had ingredients that are actually really prescription only, and yet these things are being supplied through this mobile service. And to advertise that you treat cancer is actually illegal. Certainly to advertise that you can cure cancer is still highly illegal. You are not allowed to do that. And to say that you have ingredients that are prescription only normally, that is also a no-no. And just to say it's a miraculous product, you see it's obviously just uh, advertising hype. So the TGA, which can be a bit of a wet lettuce at times when dealing with some of these uh, organisations, at least has come down here and given a fine to the company, Mode Medical, trading as Drip IV, and our executive of the company, this uh, close to $160,000. Now, depending on how successful a company is, that might be a serious issue. It might not be. But uh, at least they are doing something. So in this case, yeah, sort of good. But I'd like to see more of it. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Bytes.com.